So tonight, um, welcome to Straight Science. This is an evening public sem science seminar series put out by UAF Northwest Campus in Nome and UAF Alaska Sea Grant. This is the home office these days. So welcome to Nome, everybody. And we have Catherine Burchock. Catherine Burchock, no stranger to Nome and no stranger to our region and points uh, south or north. Catherine is all about the sounds that the animals are making underwater. And we were just having a conversation that you know, wasn't classified, but she can't give any state secrets, no questions on the submarines, because that's something that I guess, if you're specializing in underwater activities and sounds, that's something you know a little bit about. So Catherine Burchock is an acoustician with the Passive Acoustics Group at Alaska Fisheries Science Center Marine Mammal Lab. We are thrilled to have you back, Catherine. Please let us know um, how it is with our with our whales and all our singing animals. And this is the time of year that our animals are really starting to sing and pick up their pick up their sounds and really just, it's a wonderful time of year up here in the Bering Strait region. So um, we are really eager to hear what you have to tell us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gay. Um, so tonight I'll be presenting on behalf of the Passive Acoustics team. Um, and I'd like to introduce them now. It's myself, Jessica Krantz, Stephanie Gracia, Dana Wright, Bryn Kimber, Eric Brain, Jenna Harlicker, and Dan Woodridge. And of course, it is not advancing. There we go. Um, so I have lived in Seattle for the past 13 years with my husband, John, and my son, Birch. Um, I am the granddaughter of John Birchock and Mary Volk from Clareton, Pennsylvania, um, and their parents immigrated to the United States from Slovakia. Um, I'm also the granddaughter of Giuseppe um, Joseph and Denuncia Alberta Sergi from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and they immigrated over from Italy when they were children. Um, my grandpa, John, has was passed before I was born, um, but I carry my grandma Mary's tenacity. Um, she taught me if there's work to be done, you roll up your sleeves and you do it. Um, I am sentimental like my grandpa, Joseph, um, and I've always admired his tailor skills and his kindness. And I share my love of plants with my grandma, Alberta, um, who always cautioned me to stop and smell the roses. Um, and I recognize that Pennsylvania was a place that my grandparents came to have a better life for their families. Um, but I, I also want to recognize that it's home to the Carlisle Indian School that brought many of your family's sorrow. So um, with that, I'm gonna continue on. Um, I was a seasonal biologist for a lot of my life. So not unlike the whales, I spent a lot of my adult life migrating north to south along the Eastern seaboard. Um, two of the jobs I have um, guided me to the talk I'm giving you today. So the first was at the top there. Um, I worked in the Gulf of St. Lawrence with blue whales. Um, and this job taught me that you can learn a lot about animals if you just sit still quietly and listen and watch. Um, and the second job was in the swamps of eastern Arkansas, shown there in green. Um, I was part of a team that was trying to look for an extinct woodpecker, um, the ivory bill woodpecker. And my part of the, the team was I would go out into the swamps every two weeks and turn microphones around that I had strapped to trees. Um, it was kind of interesting there. The, the flooding levels were kind of crazy. Um, you could see at the level of my head there is where the water level was before when we took a canoe in to put this microphone on the tree. And when we got to this spot, um, we, we could not actually retrieve this one this year. Um, but what it taught me is that when you're working in really big remote areas, being able to put um, listening devices out that you could just retrieve after a while really gives you a lot of information. So that brings me to um, Alaska. So all of these red dots are basically a large version of that microphone I had strapped to the tree. Um, in the middle, you can see how large these are. That's me to scale with one of the recorders. Um, the tube mostly has batteries just to keep it going for a full year. Instead of every two weeks, we go, we go every year and turn these things around. Um, they're very heavy. We have to use a ship's crane to deploy them, but they keep, it keeps them in place for the entire year. So they're there when we go back to retrieve them the next year. Um, we've been deploying these since 2007. 
Um, like I said, they're in for a full year recording um, and about half of them are co-located with oceanographic instrumentation um, from the PMEL group, Phyllis Dabino's work. So it's collecting both oceanographic information and information on the, the animals going by. Um, so we're listening, what can we hear? So if you are a relatively young human, your hearing range is from about 20 Hertz to about 20 kilohertz. Um, as you age, this range gets smaller and smaller. Um, just to give some indication, the, the landline telephone transmits signals from one kilohertz to four kilohertz. Pretty much all of our communication could be done in this range. But for marine mammals, there's a lot that produce sounds below this 20 hertz, and those are called infrasonic sounds. Um, and a lot of baleen whales, like fin whales, produce sounds in this range. You get above 20 kilohertz, you're in the ultrasound range. And a lot of tooth whales, like harbor porpoise, make sounds up in this range. So how do you study sound that you can't hear? Um, and what we do is, like, you take a... Can we get somebody to mute? I'm getting a lot of feedback. Got it. Um, thank you. Um, like you take a prism and pass light through it and get all the different colors. What we do is take the sound recordings, pass them through math and get a picture. And this picture is called a spectrogram. And what it represents is along the horizontal axis, we have time and along the vertical axis, we have frequency. And the color indicates the loudness. So the hotter the color, the louder it is like the reds, the dark blue, the cooler the color, the quieter it is. This is one um, sound from a bearded seal. And I'm gonna play that now for you, hopefully. And you'll follow the sound that you're gonna be hearing the most is this signal that's the reddest in the middle. You can hear some other ones in the background there. So that is one male bearded seal and they're making this sound. It's, it's very long. Some of them can be a minute and a half long and basically it's a male competition thing. So you're a better mate, the longer you can make this signal. And just remember this when I get to the point where I'm showing you the, the bearded seal results. Um, this is just one seal making one sound. Oops, here we go. Okay, so for our analysis, for an analyst to go through and look at every single sound, they, they'd be there for decades doing that. So what we do is we display these spectrograms kind of in book form. So here you see basically three minutes worth of recordings that the analyst can just look at and decide what is in there. Um, we analyze 100% of the recordings that are collected um, for 11 species of whales and seals, walrus, also human-made sounds like vessels and air guns and environmental sound like ice. And the analyst is presented with um, basically buttons that they can click, what's in here or not. So they could look at this three minutes and say, there's bowhead whales in here. It's the, the swoopy sounds. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, um, but around 115 seconds in the middle, there's a, a swoopy sound, That's, those are bowhead whales. And then all these lines are the walrus knocking. Um, and for this reason, because they're just looking at kind of snapshots at a time, we're gonna be giving the results as daily presence. So not we're not giving a count of there was 5,000 walrus signals in this day, but how many 10 minute bins in a day had walrus present, had bowheads present. And this is what the results are gonna look like. So along the horizontal axis, we have time and note here, this is month and year. So these are three years worth of data from September of 2010 through um, September of 2013. 
And the way you can kind of orient yourself while I'm presenting today is um, looking at the blue line. These are the ice seasons. And it is on a scale from 0% ice concentration up to 100. Um, so if you look through, you can see where it says September 11, that is the open water season of 2011. And then you get back up into the ice season of 2012 and so on. Um, the black lines, there is one for each day. And it is 100% if 100% of the 10 minute per time periods in that day had the presence of that species or sound source. Um, the gray shading on here is um, basically Murphy's Law that sometimes our recorders don't record for the whole season. It was usually battery problems in earlier years. So um, sometimes it may be that we just haven't gone around to analyzing that yet, but for the most part, what I'll be presenting today is just recorder failure. Um, this is a case where it is an open water season, or sorry, excuse me, an, an ice season where the species is present, basically coming in when the ice was forming, staying there all ice season long, and then leaving just as the ice was breaking up. Contrast that with this case where it's an ice season, the species is migrating through in the fall with the ice formation, and then it's migrating back through in the spring with the ice breakup. So just to show you that again, ice season, the species is there all winter long. And this one where it's basically just passing by in the fall and the spring. So now we're going to look at it on a, a full scale. And I have a note here to save my notes um, so I don't blow through this and forget about all of it. So first, um, the plots are going to be oriented with the northernmost site on the top, and I'm going to be also showing you on the map where that location is. Um, on the bottom is the southernmost mooring. I am um, going to focus first on the Bering Sea up until about Point Hope in the southern Chukchi for all the species I'll be talking about, and then I'll go up into the north slope and cover some of those so we're not bouncing around between a whole bunch of, of different types of figures. Um, another thing to note is I'm only gonna be presenting highlights here. So if there's a particular species or a particular year or, or period of years that you're interested in, my team would be happy to do a special presentation just for you or, or compile figures. Um, just please get in touch and we can do that. Um, my intention with this talk is not only just to present the information we've collected, but to show you what kind of information we do collect um, to hopefully open up some collaborations in the future. Uh, okay, so moving on to the actual results. Um, so bowhead whales, as you all know, are ice associated. So when we're looking at the figures, the places where the ice periods are happening or where the bowheads are existing. Um, looking at these two years, uh, the winter of 2013 and the winter of 2015, you can see that the bowhead presence is extending all the way down into the Southeast Bering Sea, as far down as the ice is going. Looking at just the Northern Bering Sea, um, the presence of bowhead wells in the Northern Bering Sea has been decreasing from 2013 through 2017. Um, because the ice is just, the ice season is getting shorter and the bowheads are moving with that. So the surprising thing for me is this trend broke in, this, in the winter of 2017 to 18. The ice was really, really small. I was expecting there to be very few detections of bowheads, but they were there even though the ice wasn't. Looking up into the area around Bering Strait, near neck of the woods, the, um, in earlier years, 2013 to 2015, the wells were using that area both off of Point Hope and off of the Cherokov Basin as migratory pass-throughs. So you can see, like that figure I showed you before, the animals are moving through in the fall with the ice formation and then back in the spring with the breakup. But in more recent years, 2018 on, they're overwintering the entire time in those regions. And that is continuing into 2019. Moving on to walrus, or another ice-associated species, um, as you can see here. Um, particularly 
in the, the Bering Sea south of St. Lawrence Island, they're very ice associated. When you move up into the Bering Strait region, they're there with the ice and also in the open water season, so a little of both. Um, their ice association is even more um, precise with the, the ice concentration than the bowhead whales. Um, as you can see here in 2018, when the ice was really nothing, there were very few walrus around. Um, also, as opposed to the bowhead whales that shifted from migrating through in the Bering Strait region, the walrus have been constantly there in the winter off the Cherokee Basin. Whereas off Point Hope, they're still sticking to that sort of fall and spring migration through. So gray whales are an ice avoidance species. So you can see different than the bowhead whales and the walrus, their presence is in between the ice seasons in the open water season is highlighted here. The majority of our gray whale detections are in the Hope and Chirikov basins, as you can see here, but keep in mind that our mooring locations in the Bering Sea are not ideal for gray whales. They hug the coast as they're migrating up and down and our recorders are just too far offshore. Uh, another thing to note with our detections is that from 2017 on in the Chirikov Basin, excuse me, the detections of our gray whales have been decreasing quite dramatically. And this has maintained through 2019. And in the Hope Basin, we're starting to see a decline in 2018. Hey, Catherine, can you just, um, this is Gay, can you go back one? Can you just point out where with your mouse, maybe where the Chirikov and Hope Basins are? Oh, sorry. Um, Chirikov is the yellow one. Can you see my mouse? Yes. Oh, good. Um, so this is the Chirikov Basin that's in yellow here. And then the Hope Basin's off Point Hope. It's the green one. Awesome. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, so humpback whales are a subarctic species. Um, they're also ice avoidant. As you can see here, they're in the open water seasons in between the, the ice seasons here. They are ubiquitous in the Bering Sea. They are basically every year, every location. Um, something to keep in mind is on the, um, around the Privilof Islands, I've highlighted it in red here, and here it is on the map. When the ice is kind of low, they are there all winter long. So they don't migrate down through the Aleutian Islands. Some of them don't migrate down through the Aleutian Islands to the south. Um, contrasting with the gray whales that showed declines in the Hope and Cherokee Basin, the humpback whales actually had a, a bit of an increase in detections in those areas in those same years. But in the northern Bering Sea, there were, was a decrease in detections of humpback whales um, in 2018. So right whales are assumed to be ice avoidant. And I say assumed to be because as you can see here, there's a lot of cases where there are detections of right whale upcalls under ice. Um, unfortunately, they share a lot of similarities in the calls they make with bowhead whales. So at the best we can not say, uh, an analyst looking at that's gonna say it's maybe a right whale, it's maybe a bowhead. So we leave it as ambiguous. And um, I write for now because um, this is the work of Dana Wright and she's been collaborating with Aaron Thode and Julian Bonnell um, to be able to look with our hydrophones and see how deep the animal making the sound um, is in the water column when it's calling. And it seems to be that right whales call a lot closer to the surface than bowhead whales. So when they get through these data, we might be able to take some of these um, ambiguous calls and actually include those in our results. For the moment, we are not including those as positive right well calls, and we're moving on to the ones we are certain of. So for right wells, they are common in the Southeast Bering Sea and the critical habitat, which is shown here in the white Pentagon. Um, all years, they're, they're there um, in the open water season. Um, they've been spreading north um, into the Southeast Bering Sea since 2014. Um, into the area between the Privilof Islands and St. Matt's. 
And um, we're also seeing that they are spreading northward in the northern Bering Sea as well. Um, there are more of these detections in the open water season. Um, and this continues into 2019. I just found out today from Dana. Um, and this fits really well with the sightings that have been made off of um, St. Lawrence Island. So um, anybody making those sightings, keep, keep passing that information to us because I think um, our information and, and your information are, are quite nice to have together um, to show that these whales are moving north. So fin whales um, are mostly ice avoidance. Um, again, like the, the humpback whales, there are cases where they are under the ice around the Pribilof Islands. Um, they are also very ubiquitous throughout the Bering Sea, um, except for the area around St. Matt's Island where the, the detections are really low. Um, I do want to point out that for all the rest of the species, we do that an an excuse me, analysis manually, but for fin whales, we do have uh, an auto detector, an auto detector um, that has been working quite well. And this is because fin whales make sounds that no other species really can be confused with. Um, so that's, that's working out quite well and we're able to get through a lot more of our data that way. So moving on to the North Slope results. I'm gonna be displaying the results in a, a little bit of a different way just to, to include it. So I'll walk you through that. Um, so this is a recorder off of Piavik. Um, it's the one shown here highlighted in yellow. It's about 45 nautical miles off of Point Barrow in about hundred meters of depth. And it's real close to the edge of Barrow Canyon there. And this is a recorder we've had in the water since 2007 as part of the Bowfest um, project from a long time ago. Um, so here, instead of having multiple years on a row, we have one year going from January through December. Um, each row is a year. So it starts with 2012 and goes all the way through 2019. Um, there is no data showing here because we just collected that recorder on the, the cruise Gabe was talking about and the analyst is going to be starting that soon. So stay tuned for results from that. Um, a few things I want to point out here is, um, so this is centered on the open water season in September here. So this is the middle of the winter. Um, this is the ice starting to break up and I've put a green line on April 1st today. April, happy April Fool's Day. Um, and what you can see from 2012 through 2019 is as the years go on, the detections of bowhead wells are starting to become more closer to the beginning of April and actually into the end of March. The other thing to note is in the winter of 2017 and 2018, in January, there were bowheads detected off of Ukiavik um, during those two years. Um, and when I showed this to Craig George, he said, well, where do you think they're going? Are they, are they going somewhere else as they're, they're there? They're, they're not there between February and April, where are they going? So I made a few other plots to try to show that. Um, I apologize, this is the last time I'm changing the plots on you. Um, so here I've color coded the rows, they're back to mooring sites. And it is um, color coded with the, the sites here on the map. So on the top, we have the Yavik. Um, blue is Wainwright, Icy Cape is green, Point Hope is yellow, Nome, um, which is the Cherikov Basin, is orange, and then the Northern Bering Sea is red. So this is um, now centered on the ice season, just because you can see the migration a little bit more. This is when the ice is coming in in the fall and the whales are migrating from Ukiavik down into the Northern Bering, and then around March turning back around and going back up um, into the Beaufort Sea. So this is a year before they were there in January, and I'm just gonna toggle back and forth. Here is the year where they were there in January. So without and with, and you can see that when they're there in January, it's just part of this migration. So there, it's just some bowheads that either hung around um, or were straggling, maybe a, a different type of cohort of age classes, um, but it, it really does trend down here. Um, let me show you that again. Um, it's, it's following the trend. 
Um, I can tell you that I, I looked through our results from all the other moorings in the Chukchi Sea all the way up to the Chukchi Plateau. We're not seeing the whales going anywhere else in that February to April timeframe. So they, they are just stragglers that are going down around to the Bering Sea later. Um, so the next year they were there in January was the 2017 to 18 year. Um, again, this is when the, the whales were overwintering off of Point Hope. And you can see that it's just extending down there. Um, our recorder that was inshore off of Icy Cape didn't work that year. So I just put in the one that was in the middle, um, but this, the trend still holds. And then the question is, did they continue us? Are they, they still there in January? Our 2018 to 2019 data says no. Um, they basically went from being there in January to the ice um, starting a little bit earlier in the season and they stretched back out again. So that's what we've got, and um, we're all curious to see what happened with the 1920. Um, so going back to the multiple years like I did at the beginning, um, just looking at the North Slope for these other species we were talking about. Do so you remember the, the fin wells were all over the place in the Bering Sea? Um, looking at their extent up into the North Slope, um, they, they really aren't going past Cape Lisburn in yellow here. Um, one thing to, to keep in mind is the aerial survey team did see some um, some fin wells north of the yellow dot here around where my cursor is. Um, we don't have a recorder there, so they could be there and we're just not recording them. Um, and that is something to keep in mind here. We're monitoring this sort of branch of the migration really well, but there's a lot of other areas these whales can be going, including over into Russian waters that we, we just don't have the full picture. Um, but we can tell you really well what's going on in this branch. Um, humpback whales are following sort of the same trends as the fin whales. The majority of the detections we're getting are up to that Cape Lisburn area. There are a few days here and there um, in the rest of the area. Um, even up into Wainwright where we're hearing humpbacks, but for the most part, they're, they're staying kind of at that line um, to Cape Lisburn and South. Um, so whales aren't the only things making sound in the water. Um, and this is something that Gay and I have been talking about quite a bit with her AIS um, following of the, the Russian vessels as well. Um, this is showing vessel presence um, on the North Slope over the 2011 to 2019 um, time period. And you can see sort of some historical things. So I've got circled here um, is when the Shell oil rig was up and all those vessels were there to support it. That's when we had the most vessel presence in the open water season in that area. And um, it was centered on the Icy Cape area, which was right in the middle the Burger and Klondike prospect areas, so right in here. Um, air guns are something that are used to look for, for oil and gas deposits um, and also used for various research um, activities. So um, mostly looking at the, the plate tectonics. Um, this is showing the year um, 2013. This is when there were multiple companies up doing oil exploration with different air guns. Um, so that's, that's the year it showed quite a bit. Um, again, centered on that Burger Klondike area around on Icy Cape. But something to note is off of Uktiavik here, we have air gun presence continuing. Um, we're, we're detecting them even in 20, the open water season of 2018. And um, a quick look at the data from 2019, they're, they're there as well in 2019. And those are mostly coming from off in the basin and coming just up onto the slope. Oh, here's my, my highlight I forgot to click on. Um, and then some preliminary results. So when our analysts look at the data, they're, they're doing it in, in frequency bins. So a lot of the baleen wells and walrus and vessels we have information from because they're all part of that, that middle frequency. Um, but there's a lot of animals that make higher frequency sounds um, and those take a little bit longer for an analyst to get through. So we're not quite all the way through. Um, so here's some preliminary results from um, beluga whales and the North Slope. Um, off of Point Hope, they are 
also like the the bowhead wells showing an over what overwintering presence they're not just the migrating back and forth like they did in earlier years but staying there year round um, and this is the bearded seal. And if you remember one bearded seal making one of those sounds sounded like that. And this is how much they are making sounds during the winter. Basically they, they start and they don't stop for um, several months. Um, it's, it's just loud and it's actually a, a very big part of our noise when we're trying to hear other species through it. Um, so yeah, bearded seals are up there all winter long. Um, so in summary, um, we have a lot of ice associated species like the bowheads and the walrus that are shifting north with the ice edge shifting north. Um, they're doing a lot more overwintering in the southern Chukchi Sea um, because they're, they're basically following the ice. But the bowheads are, seem to be reversing that trend, um, at least in the northern Bering Sea where they're, um, they're there even though the ice isn't. Um, and we did um, detect bowhead whales off of Uktiavik in January of 2017 and 2018. Um, the ice avoidance species, so the subarctic ones like humpbacks and rights and fins are shifting north in the open water season, um, but they're not, they're not extending all the way up yet. Um, I can figure that as time goes on, they probably will start expanding, but we're not seeing any evidence of that from the acoustics. And we are noting um, the gray wells showing a decrease in the Hope and Chirikov basins around the Bering Strait since 2017, which um, kind of fits with the, the unusual mortality event um, that's been happening there. Um, and with that, I'd like to extend an invitation coming back to um, my work with the blue wells in the St. Lawrence. Um, there's a lot of information that our recorders are collecting that we're not doing anything with yet because we don't we don't know enough about the sounds say a bowhead calf makes when it's with its mom versus a male bowhead will. If we can get more information like that, we can go back into our data because it doesn't go bad. It's it's will always be there and actually be able to present maps like this that show particulars in cohorts moving by or behaviors. Um, so for anybody that's up in the, the Alaska region that is interested in collaborating with us to perform um, certain studies where you're, you're watching and listening and providing more information that we can use um, to get that kind of information to you um, for the species that you're concerned about, please reach out. Um, and then again, this is showing this this talk was to show you what sort of information we can provide to you um if there's a space a, a, a location that would make more sense for us to be listening to that you're very interested in or a, a particular species that we haven't presented here that you're interested in um, please let us know and we can make adjustments that way as well um and with that i am done and i'm ready for questions all right. Well, thank you, Catherine. Holy cow, that was a beautiful presentation in, in many different ways. So um, first off, for those who may not be familiar with, um, um, what is this, Zoom, on the bottom there, oh, you're already getting hand claps from the real Zoom pros. On the bottom there is, you can either unmute yourself and turn your microphone, which should be red to green if you have a question, or you can go along that bottom bar and you'll see a, like a little cartoon bubble from somebody saying something in a cartoon and it says chat underneath that. If you click on that, you'll get a, um, ch a text box and you can type in your questions or, or speak. But right now, the first question is Catherine. And so the other thing I'll say before I do questions is make sure that you drop a little love in there for Catherine. It is, uh, we, we can be, an, uh, we're a time difference away for you. So I know you're up later than we are right now and you're on point to, to deal with all these people asking questions. So show her some love, give some love in the chat box. It, it really is um, very nice. Already questions are coming in. The first one from um, Linda Shaw is, is any detection of minke whales? 
Yes, um, I don't have that um, plotted up, but Stephanie and Gracia on my team has been looking at the boing calls of minke whales. They, they make this weird space alien sound um, and it's primarily detected around the Cape Lisburn area in October-ish. And I see that um, Eloise and Xavier are on. So JASCO, um, somebody from there, Julian Delarue, um, did a paper a long time ago looking at the calls of Minky Wells in that area. And Stephanie was able to look at, um, to, to go from that and be able to include a lot more data. And she's gonna be publishing that soon. Um, so stay, stay tuned for that, but mostly in October off the Cape Whisburn area. All right, and then another question in the, oh, before we go to the chat, I did see that we did have, um, I know that we have Gamble, they were trying to get on um, both on the, I think they're on, they were trying to get on Zoom, which is a small miracle actually, if that has occurred. And I just wanted to throw it open to Gamble. If you're on, if you guys had any question, um, I'm looking through the pages here. Oh, Jared, I see you're on. Do you have any questions for Catherine? I know that for anybody that's in the remote communities, it is always tenuous to have any kind of communication like this. So why don't, um, if you have a question, please feel free to speak up now regarding any of the recordings or that nice invitation to um, provide maps of what they've heard or working in the future. Any community members that are from our small communities, feel free to speak up at any time first, because like I say, having you on the line, go ahead, we have a caller. You're muted. I saw you come off the mute. All right, well, we'll take your question when it comes in. Um, let's see, Rafaela asks, killer whale presence on the North Slope, is that temporal? Is there a timeliness to that? I, I, I have a plot for her, so let me reshare. All right, um, wonderful. Thank you. The ones I thought to do. <laughs> um, wait, where's my sharing? Green, green box on the bottom. Okay, here we go. Can you guys, is it just white? It's just go. white. Yeah. There you go. We see that. All right. So there you go. Um, they, Rafaela, they tend to be where the gray wells are the most, um, but Bryn Kimber on my team has been looking at that and they are finding that um, also around where the, the bowheads are. And, and they're working with the aerial survey team um, a little bit on that. Um, but here's, here's what we've got for killer wells so far. But a lot of those, that gray from 2015 on it are just data that we have not analyzed yet. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And it, it looks like, Catherine, you had killer whale presence off just to the west of Utqiagvik, uh January 17, 18. Is that 19 too? I can't. Uh, so this, this is Wayne, right? The blue. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Just to the yeah. west. Yeah. So, yeah. There was In a January. day they were there calling all day long. <laughs> My guess is they probably killed something that day. Given the ice conditions and that big fin, that's interesting. Well, hear. that's during the open water season. I'm uh, sorry, I was looking at. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, never mind. I read it quick. All right, and let's see if there's any others in the chat. Um, from Nome, thank you for the awesome presentation on a spring hunt. My crew and I killed our outboard and could listen to the to the aluminum hull closely and pick up two to three whales 100 to 200 yards away. Very nice, what kind of whales? Go ahead. Jacob, do you know uh, what whales you were listening to? Would you see them? Well enough to know what kind? You can type it in or you can unmute. Couldn't tell, couldn't tell. Thanks Jacob. Um, there's also a, a you know long standing um, take a piece of wood like an oar right put it behind here and then put it in the water and people have been doing that for a very long time the first 
acousticians. Yes. Acousticians. So it's a, it's a, it's a, they were white looking, but they were bigger than my boat. That would be Jacob's response. When I was around the, the blue wells in the St. Lawrence, I also had the experience of being able to hear them through the hall. And that it is quite awesome. You could just feel it vibrating your entire body. It's very nice. I have a question before, um, and then we'll throw it open. So gray whales, interesting. They Are they seasonal singers? I, I just didn't think of gray whales as singing, but. So they, they make something called a bongo call. It sounds like a lot of burping. Um, it usually makes, um, when we present this to school children, it, it brings a lot of giggles. And I found when it's presented to adults, it also brings a lot of giggles, um, but it is, it is a, a, a display, um, most likely a display call. Um, so something to keep in mind with the gray whales is they make a lot of just little moany calls that are very hard to tease apart from humpbacks or, or bowheads or, or humpbacks. It's, it's, it's just one of those things that becomes ambiguous. So the, the, the bongo call, this, this songy type thing is, is the thing that we are sure of is, is gray whales. So one of the few things I, I've just heard through the grapevine um, in, you know, on the Russian side of the Bering Strait, west of, and northwest and west of St. Lawrence Island, there is the legal harvest of gray whale, you know, 110 very large robust quota given by the International Whaling Commission to Chukotka. And what I've heard is that there are, have been this, the gray whales numbers have been kind of going down there and the humpback whales, I mean, people have, even when they're going to try to harvest, you know, there's been a complaint like the, uh, too many humpbacks, you know, they're just in the way and that's not the targeted animal. So I don't know if that's helpful. Um, and I, you know, there may be, I'm sure there's somebody here from, from St. Lawrence Island on personally, when you said, where would you <clears throat> want to put a hydrophone? I would think anywhere in the strait proper, but also towards the west, because at places like Gamble and Diomede are right on that on a deer current, and it's so biologically rich. And the animals, many of the types of animals that you're listening for, really take advantage of that um, region. It's very productive. Um, I should mention that Kate Stafford at the University of Washington does have, she's had a very long-term recorder in Bering Strait, close to di the Diomede, um, as part of Rebecca Woodgate's um, oceanography monitoring there. So um, a lot of us that have recorders in do um, share our data, and Eloise is an example of that. She was able to take data from Susanna Blackwell over in Prudhoe Bay, and Kate and I, um, and, and their data from JASCO and be able to follow um, ribbon seals and, and bearded seals. So um, we're not, not holding our data in, we're, we're sharing it. But yeah, it's good, very good to know places that are, are, are gaps. Wonderful, yeah. Um, any, let's see. Can you go back to right whale, the one that depicts the ones that are not definite, I think the ambiguous. Oh, yes. Um, calls. If I can find my copy here, hold on. Share screen is the green doodah. I, I just, I'm looking for my, my top. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and everyone else, think of your questions. We do have a hand raised by Dean Stockwell, so he'll be next after this. Thanks for your patience, Dean. Um, I was checking the chat box first. Hang on. All right. Okay, we see it. In not there, you go. Perfect. Raffaella, did you have a, a question for? Yeah, yeah, I do. So, um, so does this distribution, if this would, if these are right whales, right? I mean, that extends further than what we know from the old whaling records, mm -hmm. right? And I'm asking you that as well, Gay. So this would be in some form an expansion of the range. So I'm asking both of you, I guess. I think there were some records of right whales being that far north, but they were never um, accepted. They, it was 
thought to be a typographical error. Um, yeah. So it, and, yes, from what is accepted, it would be an expansion. And from, it, it may be that the ones really far north are just the bowheads, um, but for the moment we can't, it, it's, it's basically sounds that if you looked in the textbook of what sounds do a right well make, it would be in there. Um, but it's also there underneath the ice and with a lot of bullhead singing. Um, but on the other hand, we can't say, oh, there's a bullhead around, so it can't be a right well, because there's been many sightings of right wells in the Bering Sea um, that have been around humpback wells, for example. There have been sightings of right wells swimming actually in a pair with a fin well. So just because mm -hmm. there's a around doesn't mean that a right well couldn't be around as well. And in and, the southern hemisphere, they, they do hang out with the ice. Um, yeah. So and just one follow up question, and maybe I understood this wrong, but you said something about a timeline that that was occurring. And uh, I think you said something about 2014. Am I, am I uh, remembering this with the wrong yeah. slide? So um, since about 2014 in the southern, they're, they're expanding out beyond the critical habitat. Um, okay. And these have been warmer years, and it seems from um, some work other people have done in the, the Bering Sea that in warmer years, the rails are kind of moving around more in the Bering Sea, maybe looking for food, whereas in colder years, they kind of contract into the critical habitat. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. I think the, you know, this right potential right well expansion is, is, you know, very interesting, and uh, and I hope you guys are pinpointing it and then giving validity to the old data as well as people's observation. I think that's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And, and again, I, I just really wanna emphasize that when people are out making observations, if they have any way of taking pictures, um, that would really help because we, we also need help validating our detections um, for the ones that we're not completely sure of. Um, so, yeah. Awesome, well, thank you. And thanks, Rafaela. thanks. Catherine and, and Dean's been patiently waiting with his hand up. Go for it, Dean. What's your question? Hi, Catherine. First of all, nice talk. Really enjoyed it. Thanks. Now, bear, bear in mind, I'm a phytoplankton person, so acoustics in marine mammals don't really fit in with me all that well, but the bowheads in 2018, 2019 really took a detour. They moved far north around Barrow. So my, kind of, my question is kind of, what are the limits of your detection as far as range? I know sound travels in odd ways in the ocean and you can get a far away sound that you think might be fairly close. So, and a second question comes up with your, your gray whale observations. And I'll ask you after that. Okay, um, as far as the propagation ranges, it, it varies, but for the most part, we're hearing anywhere from five to 25 miles away from our recorders. Um, usually about 15 um, miles is, is what we're hearing. Um, there are particular cases if, if it's very flat calm or if there's just a lot of ice and it's not all ragged where you can get further, um, but that, a lot of the region has um, a muddy bottom and when sound goes down to it, it basically gets sucked up in. Um, the only time sound can really propagate really, really far is if it's between two things that's not taking its energy out. So if it's between two temperature layers, um, it can be bouncing back and forth in there and go on for hundreds of thousands of kilometers. Um, and that's what happens like in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, but in our region, we just, um, from what we've kind of noted experimentally and um, from other people's observations, it, it's usually about 10 to 15 miles. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. The second question about gray whales is that in the Chirikoff Basin, they've showed a decline in the benthos, um, the amphipod beds there. And every time I've observed gray whales, they've been up off of Point Lay, blowing out these big, big mud plumes. And you also show a decrease there. Is that an indication that we're kind of losing benthos there then? Um, so following on to your first question, um, we're not detecting the full range. Um, so it, it could be that they're just shifting over maybe 30 miles to the west. 
and we wouldn't um, be able to tell that. Um, the one where they're also decreasing was off of Point Hope, so not quite as far up around as Point Lay. Um, but if, if we're taking that at face value, it seems like maybe they are um, moving into another region where there's more food, maybe over into Russian waters. And you don't detect when they blow out this mud plume or when humpbacks blow out their feeding bubble, you don't pick that up acoustically. Um, we could, it's, we, we have a lot of noise on our moorings. So we um, probably have just, we, we've never actually listened for that. Yeah. Um, but That's yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. All right. How you doing, Catherine? We probably just have a couple more questions. For no, you I'm good. That. You're hanging in there. Okay. Um, any other questions for Catherine Burchock? Fantastic talk. I have, I have two. One is a whale question. No. Anybody? Well, throw it open first. And we do have a caller. That's tough to be the one on the phone. Does the caller have any questions? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, yep, go ahead. This is Lucy in Gamble. Hey, Lucy. I have a couple of questions. Yeah, yep. I enjoyed um, the presentation, although I can't see um, the graphs and stuff. But um, did you say that there was a decrease in um, gray whale and bowhead whale around St. Lawrence Island? Let me go back to it. Did you get the question? Uh-oh. Her internet might be acting up, Lucy. She's frozen. Can you hear us? I can yeah. hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. Now you can. Now okay. we can hear you. Did you get the question? The question was, uh, has gray whales gone down? Yeah. So um, gray whales around St. Lawrence Island, we, we don't have recorders close enough to there to monitor them. Um, the recorders that we have noted for gray whales decreasing have been off of Point Hope. Um, and then um, there's a site that is about 10 hours out of the room. Um, and those are the two sites we've been noticing a decrease in our detections of gray wells. Um, as far as the bowheads go, um, we have been noticing that they are, um, we have a site that's about 125 nautical miles southwest of Gamble um, and that in the, the winter time, they have been, the, there's bowheads there pretty much the entire ice season. And as the ice season gets smaller and smaller, the amount of time the bowheads are there gets smaller and smaller. Um, except for the winter of 2017 to 18, where there was very little ice, but there were still bowheads there. So it's not that this is okay. Um, the, oh, go ahead, Lucy. Go ahead. Uh, one last question before I uh, lose connection. Um, you mentioned something about a right right whale. Um, if if we see any right whales around the island, did you want um, information on that? Yeah, absolutely. If you can pass that information to Gay, and if there's any chance of getting any sort of photographs, even from a distance, um, those would be super helpful. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. Thank you again so much for uh, the presentation you're and welcome. all your work. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, if, if you're interested, I can print out the presentation and um, pass that to Gay, and she can um, mail that to you. I can print it from here to okay. save yourself. Oh, that would be awesome. Yep. Thank I will you. do that, Lucy. Thank you. And and um, if I know you guys are going to uh, tune in, I can send you the presentation beforehand, or maybe I'll just send, start sending them to you as soon as we get them, Wait instead of waiting for the call. Thank you very much. Glad you could make it. Thank you for your question. Hey, hey, can you hear me? This is Jared. Yeah. Hi, Jared. Welcome. Yeah, um, I wonder if we, uh, uh, Catherine, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, are you are you uh, plan to uh, have a um, recorder around St. Lawrence Island? 
in your time soon? So the closest one we have to St. Lawrence Island is that one that's about 125 miles away. We don't have anything closer. Um, uh, at, at this point, I don't have any funding to have my own cruises, so I go along on other people's cruises and put them in where I can. Um, but if there is a particular place around St. Lawrence Island that you would really like us to monitor, we can do that. Jared, is that something that might be worth talking about um, later? If there's interest, yep. uh, that, that will be a uh, very uh, interesting uh, topic. Okay, we can we can add that actually. I know we're you and I are going to have a phone call here sometime soon, and um, we can add that to the topic or or have a special meeting with Catherine. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. However, you guys want to do it, that would be great. The only thing we have to keep in mind is that we really need to keep it away from close to the border because recorders that are deposited even in US waters there tend to go missing. So we just need to be smart about where we put it in. Yep. Thank you, Catherine, on that. Any other questions for Catherine? No, um, the re the re go ahead. No, are the, are the recorders, um, do they have to be away from the ice or, or what? No, so the recorder is anchored to the bottom and it sticks up about 20 feet from the bottom. So as long as the ice isn't super deep, um, it just stays there all year, all year round and the ice comes and goes over top of it and does not affect it. Okay, thank you. So um, my question was, you said that there was humpback whales all the time now in the northern Bering Sea. Is that right? Um, close to the Privilofs. Close to the Privilofs. So in the Bering Sea, and you know, we're always we're always telling people, we're always being told, oh, the whales are going to Hawaii. Nah, they're not all going to Hawaii is what you're telling me. Right. So can you tell, are those males or females or do you just, in the song, do they sound different when you're recording them? So you could say, oh, look at that. We even have females spending the winter or... Do you know? Um, I do not know yet. Um, Jenna Harlicker on our team is going to be working on that. Uh, we have a project that um, I don't know if you heard in the news. Um, Google is working with the Pacific Islands um, to do an automatic detection of their um, their humpback song. And so we have a project now where we're going to be taking that model, trying to apply it to our data. Um, it's expected not to work really well because it's just, there's different, we have bullheads and other things in our area where they don't really have down in Hawaii. So um, Dan Woodridge on my team is going to be working with that to get it working on our data. And then we're actually gonna be comparing the songs we get in the Bering Sea um, with the ones in Hawaii and the ones off of Mexico to try to figure out what populations are where in the Bering Sea because unless you do specific photo identification or getting biopsies, and that just takes a lot of field effort. Um, you're not gonna be able to tell the difference um, between those distinct population segments. Right. But um, the, it was known probably back in the 90s off of Virginia Beach. Um, it was always thought that those whales went from New England down to um, Silver Bank in the Dominican Republic in those kind of areas. And then they discovered there was a bunch of juvenile male humpbacks just hanging off of Virginia Beach. So my guess is it's probably some sub-adults just hanging out because they have no need to go down south. Much more fun in the Bering Sea. I think so, yeah. All right, well, again, make sure, for the audience, make sure you put some, some um, love in there for Catherine. And, oh, you're getting all kinds of good stuff. And um, hopefully, Catherine, we can get you back here with the rest of the story. My very last question tonight is, did you find your extinct bird in Arkansas? I, <laughs> were you looking? You were looking for the white ivory billed woodpecker. Yeah. Um, the the story there is that um, somebody it was it was thought to be extinct, and somebody that year had s swore that they saw one. So we were part of a team from Cornell University. Um, my husband's a, a birder, so he kind of roped us into this, and he actually spent three summers there looking. Nobody ever found it again. Um, 
The, the issue with the microphones I put up is that it was listening for a sound that was called a double knock. So just like that. Unfortunately, these microphones got a lot of rain on them. So they had like billions of possible detections of these double knocks. So no photos, no, no sounds were ever saw, seen. And yeah, there's a lot of very discouraged people from that, that effort. Well, that's okay. That's, um, that's good. You tried. That's yeah. half the battle. And but so man, the, the swamps of Eastern Arkansas are beautiful. If you ever have a chance to, to get there. Eastern Oregon, is it? Arkansas. Arkansas. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. And, um, and also the, the, the last thing I'll say is you did inherit your grandmother, Mary's smile. So that was, <laughs> thank you for showing your, your folks. That was real interesting. Yeah. So thanks for that. Yeah. Thank you all, everyone, for our next Straight Science is going to be um, next Thursday. We've got Jane Belaveric with the Alaska Sea Life Center and Colleen Reichmuth with UC Santa Cruz uh, Long Marine Lab. And what they're going to talk about is when we, from the Bering Street region, when we have seals that are live stranded and that make their way into Anchorage, they become non-releasable they'll never go back to the wild so what does the alaska sea life center do with them when they, they rehab them they're they're brought in with some sort of problem and then how do they contribute to um, research some of which we heard about uh two straight sciences ago.